Institute. Since starting his studies on the sea crates 20 years ago, he has never once been bitten. I've always had the approach that they're not harmful and that they're not likely to, to hurt me, bite me or do anything uh, of that nature. While some species can be aggressive, the ones they've bagged aren't. It's just as well, because the job calls for some intensive handling. Although their markings appear distinctive, there can be a great variety of pattern and colour between individuals of the same species. It takes an expert to determine details like the species and sex of a particular snake. Once they've been identified and measured, a small plastic tag is attached beneath the skin. It's a harmless procedure, and the coded tag will allow them to identify each snake in the water. By placing them back on the same bommie, I can see if the snakes are going to be faithful to a particular territory or if they're going to move randomly over the reef. So if I come back in 12 months' time and find that the snakes are still sitting on the same bommie, then I can be reasonably assured that the snakes have been there over, that, over the intervening period. Ashmore isn't just a wonderland for scientists. The islands that sit atop the reef are also an important landfall for many birds, locals and migrants alike. Large numbers of crested terns breed and raise their chicks here during the calm spell. They're joined by many other species, such as noddies and boobies. A sample of snakes tagged. The rest of Mick's time will be spent following and observing the behaviour of the different species in his study area. One of the most common varieties at Ashmore is the olive sea snake. At up to five feet long, they deserve some respect. Although their venom is lethal, these creatures are reluctant to bite. It is their grace in the water and their adaptations to it that elicit admiration. The gentle undulations of their body and their flattened paddle-like tail combine elegance with efficiency. A row of flattened scales along the belly serves as a keel, stabilizing them as they glide through the water. Red bass or sharks occasionally take juveniles, but with few natural predators, it would appear that the adults have no need for an aggressive nature. As much as 20% of their oxygen comes from the water via their skin. The rest comes from the air, but just a few quick breaths are sufficient. The nostrils seal during dives. A single lung stretches for most of the snake's body, holding enough air to sustain them for nearly an hour whilst active or two hours at rest. They are also extremely inquisitive. Divers have often mistaken this for aggression. They're very curious snakes. They're very visually oriented. They see things shiny. They detect movement. Uh, they detect contrast very well. It's their curiosity, I think, that uh, people often misinterpret as being aggression. They, they swim right in to investigate something thoroughly, and, of course, the, the way they perceive their environment is usually by 
the sense of touch and also by taste. And so they're usually not happy with something unless they've been able to taste it. And so that involves uh, tongue flicking. So divers and equipment in the water, it gets a, a very thorough check out by these snakes just exploring the environment, just, just out of natural curiosity. Olives are generalist feeders. Unlike the rays that forage exclusively in the coral sediment, they take a range of small prey from different parts of the reef. Their eyesight is good, but to truly identify a food item, they must get close enough to taste it. The snake is attracted to dark patches on the reef. In the dim light of the crevice, the snake's forked tongue comes into its own, providing a stereo sense of taste, just as in the land snakes. Every hole is occupied, but the olive's innate curiosity will eventually turn up something. Sometimes it's an unpleasant surprise. Prey is plentiful at Ashmore. When a victim is found, it's time for venom and fangs to do their work. After one or more strikes, the snake will secure the fish with its body while paralysis takes effect. Without limbs, it can't hold the fish steady as it swallows. Instead, the snake separates each side of its jaws and with its fangs begins to walk its way up the fish's body. This injects venom into more of the fish, and the enzymes it contains begin the job of digesting the flesh. One good meal may be enough to sustain an olive sea snake for a week, but like so much else about them, exactly how often they must eat is a mystery. Many of the other species are specialist feeders. The horn-headed sea snake hunts across the sediment flats, investigating the sandy burrows of the local shrimps. But it's not the shrimp the snakes are after. It's the tiny gobies that associate with them. Many burrow feeding snakes have developed slender heads and necks to work their way into the deep holes. This species has spiny scales. Perhaps they help gain purchase and squeeze down the hole. Despite its fierce appearance, this snake's intrusions are not always successful. Instead, it's an underwater game of cat and mouse. <laughs> 